so this um, study uh, was focused in the investi investigation on of um, subsistence strategies in Lake Glacial Italy. So I'm um, taking you back in time a little bit. Um, so um, from the last glacial max maximum to the early Holocene, uh, hunter-gatherers and animals must have experienced rapid and extreme climate and environmental changes that certainly affected their ability to cope with these changes and procure their resources. Um, so the environment can really change a lot with ice and without. And um, so it can be a challenging uh, uh, task to just uh, eat, basically. Um, this period also corresponds to socioeconomical and cultural changes that eventually led to the transition to agriculture, as we've heard in this uh, uh, conference. Um, one of the hypotheses that have been put forward in order to explain um, subsistence strategies for uh, hunter-gatherers is the long-distance transhumans, which imply that uh, hunter-gatherers would follow uh, the prey species as they would move naturally, wild species that would move naturally across the landscape in search of the fresh pasture. And sometimes seasonality can be very extreme, so they could really be forced to do that. Some of the also uh, implied that uh, some of the routes followed by these Paleolithic animals were also those that were lately uh, exploited and employed by, sorry, exploited by um, during pastoral transhumans and these nowadays really still taking place. So um, with, um, with this study, we wanted to test the underlying hypothesis uh, of the long distance transhumans, which is where these animals are actually moving. For this, we used uh, uh, isotopes of, by now, we should know everything about. Um, so isotopes are taken over, and, uh, taken over with food and drink uh, from the environment and fixed in the, um, in the skeletons, which is what we analyze um, as archaeologists. Um, so um, stable isotopes can provide uh, a proxies for environmental and seasonal conditions, uh, whereas the radiogenic isotopes uh, do provide information about the landscape that was dwelled by these animals. And the combination of two, I think, is quite interesting. We focused on six Paleolithic sites uh, from peninsular Italy, um, with an age ranging from 20,000 to 8,000 BP, so covering the glacial, um, the warming phase. So we concentrated on six for a big project, but today I'm going to talk only uh, about the site of Sette Cannelli, which is located in... Uh, um, in northern Latium, um, between northern Latium and uh, uh, southern Tuscany. Um, this archaeological sequence uh, is, has provided lots of uh, um, uh, deer and, uh, and echoes citrontinos, and so there are good uh, uh, opportunity to study both browsers and grazing, browsing and grazing animals. Um, for those of you who don't know, echoes citrontinos was a sort of an equid that got extinct um, at the end of the Paleolithic, and it was quite common in the Mediterranean area. Um, so uh, both these hypsodont animals uh, grow these, uh, their teeth uh, in a sublinear um, uh, way. So the, um, the sampling of their teeth, um, sequential sampling of the teeth, is a good opportunity to study uh, the conditions that these animals experience, at least for one or two seasons. Uh, after that, the mineralization closes as a system and then uh, it blocks the information ready for us. Then we sample these, sam these uh, specimens uh, sequentially, perpendicular to the elongation uh, in order to have a temporal um, um, information, temporal record. And we all have hope to get these sinusoidal patterns where, for example, in the case of oxygen, um, uh, high value represent uh, summers and low values represent winters. And, you know, we can also have an idea of the amplitude uh, of the season, uh, season, seasonality, sorry. When we combine this proxy with the strontium uh, within the tooth, then we can have the potential to have the information about where the animal was in uh, each season. Um, the study area is uh, located, as I said, in uh, central Italy, as well here. 
So uh, from a geological point of view, this map is a, uh, is a frame of about 24 square kilometers around the site, um, uh, for which we also try to investigate the bioavailable strontium, um, collecting samples from 13 different sites. Um, so these areas are characterized by uh, volcanic rocks in the northwestern part, uh, which have got a quite typical isopic fingerprints, but unfortunately for us, not too high. Um, and uh, the northeastern part is instead characterized by uh, mainly Mesozoic formations, where the southern part is characterized by alluvials, pleocotinary uh, materials that unfortunately are quite dull, and um, uh, these outcrops of travertines that instead were quite interesting. These are the results that we found. Um, you know, we collected rocks, soils, plants, water, snails, and dentines uh, from site one. Um, we carried out this environmental study about 10 years ago now. So um, probably we shouldn't go do these samples anymore. But anyway, um, so there is a wide variability in the same site according to which um, item we, we actually study. Uh, just to summarize this variability, um, this huge variability uh, in rocks, uh, like up to 0.73, um, is highly attenuated in uh, the dental, uh, in the tooth enamel of these individuals, which I think was quite interesting. Um, and also, maybe later we have to discuss about the significance, the significance of certain rocks in certain areas as well. Um, nevertheless, although this attenuation, we actually managed to um, found some interesting patterns in the, in the teeth, which are quite consistent, I believe. Apart from some cases, it's always the case now when you do sciences, so you've got the exception, which is annoying. But anyway, um, so these three layers are actually uh, three climatic phases uh, uh, of the lake glacial, so cold, sorry, warm, so cold, warm, and, and cold again. And we tried to study the animals from these three uh, layers. Um, so back to the patterns. Red here represents the oxygen and stopping composition, and blue is a strontium. And they are plot one versus the other. Um, and uh, it is pretty clear, apart from a couple of cases of half, you know, parts of teeth, that there is a counter pattern between oxygen and strontium. So basically, when strontium is low, uh, oxygen is high, means summered in low radiogenic areas. Vice versa, where strontium is high, uh, it's normally occurring where oxygen is low. And this is pretty clear in uh, red deer, and it's also clear to me also uh, in the teeth from the Aquacidum uh, tinus, although the, the shape is much more noisy. Um, I was puzzled by these tooth, so I analyzed them in two different places in Cape Town and, uh, and Bradford, and it came out with the same, exactly the same uh, values. And actually these patterns have been kind of funny patterns in horses, quite recurrent, let's put it this way. Not easy like uh, sheep or goat uh, or um, cow. Anyway, I think that still in these animals, although harder to see, uh, there isn't a counter pattern. Um, um, they need to explain. So our explanation was that um, these animals were, were summering, uh, so having high oxygen in less radiogenic areas and wintering in um, more radiogenic areas. Um, so going back to our uh, map, well, this means that these animals were actually probably mo moving uh, from the coast where they would spend the summer, they were going to the beach in the summer, <laughs> and uh, the winter inland. Um, so this is exactly the opposite of what we wanted to demonstrate, but you know, such is life. Um, I, want to, I want to point out and to stress instead something that I found very interesting as I was uh, uh, analyzing th this data set, is the role of strontium concentration. Now, in these plots here, um, you have the concentration that we measured in uh, um, the teeth in this case, so um, enamel modern animals and dentines. And this concentration can be huge, right? Strontium's concentration is not always done. It's easier 
but expensive to do it on Teams. But it's even more expensive to do it with the multi-collector RCPMS because you have to do it some in another way. So a um, few studies uh, do uh, measure concentration, and this also for us it was quite lucky. Um, so it's pretty clear that there's a difference between uh, enamel in a uh, horse and, and deer, and that the dentin are going very high, which is probably an indication of diagenesis. And one, sorry. And one, if one consider uh, the values of the rocks, so this is the massive variability that you observed in uh, strontium concentration in, uh, in the field, both in soils and, uh, and, and rocks, and plants are here, here are watered. Well, we see that these three samples represent the travertines and the sheltered rocks, so they're very similar, and clearly those um, uh, dentins go towards them. Now, in Italy, in the uh, Tyrrhenian area, there are um, several outcrops of travertines. And in 1979, Barbieri et al. demonstrated that uh, in Italy there are um, two types of uh, travertines, okay, type A and type B. So, same formation, um, same lithology, same rock, almost same age, uh, the variability of strontium can be between 20 ppm to 3,700 ppm. Now, this has a huge impact on the concentration that we may measure in, a, uh, in the animals. So just bear that in mind. I think it's important. I may change in other areas, but in certain areas, it can be important. Just to show you that, you know, the huge variability that we saw in rocks, it's actually also huge in, uh, in the concentration. And they're not related, by the way. Uh, so going back to uh, the teeth, um, here um, uh, I've plotted the, the enamel and the dentines in each tooth, and this is uh, an enamel. So clearly that one has exchanged completely, so sorry, that <laughs> cut out <laughs> from the record. But concentrated on the enamel only, um, it, it is pretty clear to me at least that um, there is a, a difference in uh, concentration between horses and deer in enamel. And one of the explanations could be, which I the one I'd like to, to favor, is that's a biological signature. So basically these animals uh, um, were roaming different areas. Like for example, um, Acusidruntinos might, might have dwelt in the lowlands of uh, the area I showed, which is rich, very rich in, uh, in, uh, in strontium. So by uptaking grass compared to, uh, to leaves, they would even have enriched their composition, you know, even more. Um, so I think this difference is biological. And then we also find uh, an interesting difference between uh, the dentines, which is very hard to explain, because if the dentines are mixing with the barrel environment, then one would expect that these, these dentins should be all here, but that's not what's happening. I don't have an explanation for that, so if you have ideas, you're very welcome. Basically, um, maybe um, the horse dentin is more prone to exchange with the environment, or maybe the composition of the dentin was already closer to the uh, isotopic composition of the um, barren environment. So this is a, still an open question. And uh, just uh, another uh, picture to show that um, here you, we have the seasonal patterns versus the dentin values. And um, just to show that the dentins in horses really tend to be closer to, to um, the, barrel, the barrel environment, the composition of the barrel environment, the, the dentin in the deer tends to be uh, higher and closer to the enamel. Uh, so to conclude, the sequential measurements of oxygen and strontium isotopes in tooth enamel of ungulate teeth is a powerful tool to investigate past animal mobility and transhumans, as we're all here to discuss this. Okay. Um, different ranging patterns and roaming areas uh, can possibly be identified, uh, and not only with the use of uh, strontium isotopes, because in that area, although the different lithologies, the strontium isotopic composition, unfortunately, is quite 
squeeze. And now you can see, maybe you said before that it's stretch actually very uh, spread, but that rock that was outside the, you know, the scale, and a couple of them, they're not very represented. So they are there, they're geological formation, the one may be intrigued to measure, but they actually are not representative, plus they're not releasing much strontium. And finally, yeah, I want to remark the potential of strontium concentration for this type of studies, um, both to investigate the animal mobility, but also to kind of start tackling uh, diagenesis in these samples. And I should probably acknowledge the, you know, all the team that I work with, and I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.